implementing the essential aid security practices will help you and your business stay out of harm's way from malicious actors. This is our second video in our series of implementing the essential aid for small and medium enterprises. Welcome back to our series on essential aid. In the previous video, we discussed why it's important, what is the essential aid, how it's been developed, and why you can utilize it for getting your business on track with the right security policies and procedures. And in this video, we're gonna dive a little bit more into the practicals of what each of the essential eight mean, how you can start to think about implementing them and how you can translate those into Google Workspace features for you to make sure that your business is well protected. The essential eight have been created by the Australian Signals Directorate. And the purpose of them is to help reduce the threats of cyber attack for businesses, particularly in Australia. But these are foundational principles that can be applied to you wherever you are in the world. Now, cyber is probably one of the biggest risks to small business in terms of security these days that you basically have to deal with and all of your staff will have to deal with on a daily basis as well. Unfortunately, it's become pretty common and pretty easy to get into cloud-based systems because everything's now online and it means that actors who are in any place all over the world can potentially get access to your systems if your team are not well protected. So building in great security principles is really the digital and online equivalent of making sure the shop door is locked up the padlock is on, there's an alarm system activated, and there's a back-to-base phone system so that someone gets notified if someone's trying to break in. Basically, we're, we're doing all the same kind of principles where we're making sure that the bad guys are kept out and our business data is protected, but we're doing this in the cloud digital world. Now, a big challenge when everyone is working remotely at home is many of your staff are probably using their own devices to access their work account. Now, whether that's a bring your own device laptop or computer type arrangement where they're literally using their own device to work, or maybe they're just connecting to work apps and work information on their mobile phones. It's important to make sure that you have these devices managed and your company information managed so that that data doesn't go walkabout. And the example that I typically use when I talk about locking down and managing devices for business owners is imagine if you had a staff member who had access to, for example, the accounting data of your business. Maybe it's your bookkeeper or your accountant who needs to access that on a daily basis. And they have the Gmail or the Google Drive app installed on their phone, but they don't have a passcode set up on their phone. Unfortunately, if they leave their phone on a train or on a bus and someone else picks it up, they've got access to absolutely everything inside your business. Now, just getting access to emails or your Google Drive folder is not really the worst scenario. A bad actor can't really do much with your profit and loss statement. But what someone can do if they have access to an email account within your organization is to pretend to be that user. And they could potentially start emailing you, the CEO or the IT manager and say, hey, you know what, I've got this expense that I need to prove, or I've got this transfer that needs to happen to XYZ supplier. And they would look through your emails and they would find a supplier that you're used to making payments to. And they would send you a fake bank account, which normally you wouldn't double check bank accounts when you're doing a pay run day to day if you're receiving it from one of your colleagues who does it every week. And they're going to say, hey, I need this done today because it's really urgent. Otherwise, they're not going to send the order for XYZ project to XYZ client, which they would have easily got from the emails. And you can see where this is going. Very quickly, business owners unfortunately start to lose money with these kind of scams once someone has access to an internal email account because they don't have to pretend to be your email address or pretend to be your staff member from a fake email account outside the business. Once they're into an internal email address, they can very quickly start to make real damage by using a real email address to send fake phishing emails within the company. Now, that's just one example, and yes, it's pretty bad, but effectively, once someone has access to a Google account, they've pretty got much got access to the house. So that's why we wanna do as much as possible to lock down our Workspace account and our eight security principles here are gonna help us to do that. Now, it's important to say these don't just apply to the Google Workspace world. These are broad IT tasks. And so if you're running server infrastructure or Microsoft Azure for your management of user credentials on machines, then either yourself or the IT person responsible for managing devices in your business should be implementing these right across the network. Now, if you need help with that, you can click on the link down below and one of our teams will be very happy to assist you. First up, let's talk about whitelisting. Now, application whitelisting effectively locks down any applications that can run on your team's computers and you are only able to run an application that is approved by management. Now, this may seem to be a little bit extreme and you know, when you've got less than five people in the company, it may be less of a risk, 
But once you have a large organization and you're deploying machines that you don't really ever see in the office because they're working with team members who are out on the road all the time or going to a staff member's home and seldom coming back to the office to be checked by IT, you can start to run into issues where third-party malware can easily be installed or someone's kids get on the computer and start installing things that are gonna potentially slow it down and impact productivity. But the most important risk that you have is unauthorized applications from unauthorized developers can very quickly have security vulnerabilities. And the unfortunate thing is with a small independent developer building an application that might be useful for you to download once, but then you forget about on your computer after a number of years, they're the kind of ways that someone can get into your computer because insecure older software that is not well maintained tends to leave back doors open and that's how people can tend to get in. So it may see a little bit draconian to lock down what applications people can install on their machines, but it is a good idea to make sure that your team are well protected and whitelisting is the way to do that. Recommendation number two is managing patches. And what that basically means is keeping your applications up to date. Now, thankfully, most modern operating systems are automatically updating. And I mean, Windows and Mac machines basically just download the updates themselves and even will install them as you're restarting. Now, Chrome OS is even smarter in that it installs the applications in the background to a second copy of your OS. And then when you restart the computer, it just boots into the backup OS and you're good to go. But either way, you wanna make sure that these automatic installed updates are actually in place and you wanna make sure that you're monitoring them with your team. Now, there's plenty of third-party monitoring software which will actually monitor your end user computers and let you know when an application or when the operating system is out of date. That's also the kind of thing that's pretty easy to delegate to a managed IT service provider who can install software on your computer and manage that for you. So that may be something to consider if you haven't already. Next up is management of macros in Microsoft Office. And my recommendation here is to actually completely disable the use of macros, except for anyone who really needs to use them inside your company. And ideally that would be finance managers or power users only. If macros are open, they're the easiest ways for people to get into Windows-based machines and Windows-based software. And it's one of the reasons why we basically have a ban of Microsoft software inside our company, because we know how easy it is for vulnerabilities to strike using macros. Now macros are very powerful when they're used in the right way for helping you to automate workflows, but unfortunately they can run into problems allowing spyware and malware to quickly get into an organization and then spread through the Microsoft applications because of their literal ability to automate tasks and that can be unfortunately put to bad use. If you wanna go all in on Google, this is a good way of completely removing the risk here. If you're using a Chrome device and you're operating with Google Workspace Online, all of the Google documents are completely protected from this kind of attack. And even if you're using a Microsoft document in the browser using Google Drive, well, you're also protected as well because they also don't run the local native Windows macros that can cause these issues. Yet another point for Google and a reason to switch over to Chrome OS and the Google ecosystem. Recommendation number four is application hardening. And that's basically a fancy way of saying to lock down the security features of the individual applications that you have. Now, one of the most important ones to do this on is your web browsers, whether you're using Internet Explorer, Edge, or Firefox, or Chrome. You wanna make sure you're configuring the security settings on those to lock down things like downloads. You may choose to enforce something like safe search via a policy, and you can even work with the browsers to decide what kind of content can or can't be downloaded for your users. Thankfully, most of the Chrome user settings can actually be managed for free via the Google Workspace admin portal. You just go into device management, into user settings in Chrome, and you can start to configure some of the security settings. If you wanna go a step further and you wanna use Chrome OS devices, well, you may be interested to implement some device-based settings. For that, you'll need a Chrome OS device management license on each device that you're using, but that's our strong recommendation if you're managing a fleet of Chrome books or Chrome boxes. Number five is restricting administrator privileges. And this is something that most business owners will probably have out of the box. Sure, you may be the super administrator, but you're probably not designating administrator privileges to anyone else in the business unless they're a senior manager and you need them to help set up other users. But it doesn't hurt to go and check and manage your admin panel and decide who really needs access to different controls because an administrator in a workspace account has the ability to add and remove users. And if someone's account is compromised and happens to be an administrator account, well, someone can pretty easily spin up new accounts and potentially create damage by pretending to be other staff. That's a big risk to look out for, and you wanna make sure that you restrict that as much as possible. Now, not only do you have risks from outside the business, but if you have somebody inside the business who's maybe a staff person, who's a bad lever, or even a business partner who's on the way out, 
they could potentially become a risk as well. If someone's an administrator, they have the ability to create new accounts and they could delete other people's data, they could send emails pretending to be somebody else, or they could you know, use that to basically reset your password and take an account hostage. Unfortunately, we have seen this happen many times, especially when there's a divorce included in a business relationship breakdown and a partnership breakdown at the same time. Look out for those kind of risks. If you wanna completely protect your account, you may consider creating a completely separate administrator profile and that administrator profile is only used for administering the business and not used for day-to-day -day use by a business director. Number six is regularly patching operating systems. And we already talked about this a little bit in application management, but the important thing with operating systems is from time to time, there will be critical security releases that come out that need to be rolled out to your team very quickly. Now, this can be a challenge if you've got a fleet of multiple computers, which is where, again, I'll make the recommendation that you consider working with an IT managed service business who can actually help to automate the patching of machines so you can make sure if there is a critical update released, it's quickly rolled out to your machines. Unfortunately, the way that software works is once a vulnerability is discovered, every single computer out in the field, everywhere in the world, is vulnerable to that particular issue. And it's not until the update is applied that that hole is patched and that computer is then safe. Software development and software developers are not perfect. And unfortunately, as those issues are found, you need to very quickly patch them to make sure that the hole is closed. It's a bit of a cat and mouse game between the hackers and the bad actors and those who are on the good side of making sure that your operating system and your business is protected. And you wanna make sure that you're on the front foot by making sure critical security patches are released and implemented immediately. Number seven is multi-factor authentication, which we talk about so much on this channel. I don't think I need to beat the drum anymore, but as you know, it's very easy to implement inside Google Workspace. You can set an excellent policy in there, and there are many options for the ways that you can implement a second factor device. Our recommendation is not to use a mobile phone number for a call or a text, but instead use a hardware key, a passcode, or potentially a Google Authenticator app online for you to access your account as a second factor, and that will keep your account well secured. Number eight is daily backups. And this one is a little bit of a curious one with Workspace. I've created a number of videos on why you should be backing up your Workspace account, which go into detail. But to give you the highlight, Google's very unlikely to lose your data. They have your data stored in multiple geographically dispersed locations, and it's very unlikely that they're gonna have an oopsie and have a data center disappear with your business data on it. However, there are threats of cyber attack, potentially a bad actor internally inside your business, or just by accident, someone thinking they're doing the right thing by cleaning up and accidentally having data disappear from the company. And unfortunately, we see these kind of incidents all the time. And for that reason, we do recommend having a third-party backup for all the data inside your Google Workspace account. Now, of course, the Signals Directorate and the Security Essentials recommendation covers all of your devices, not just your Workspace account, but an easy way to manage your backups, and I would say this is like the 80-20 of backups, is to have a policy where all data in the company is automatically saved into your Google Workspace account, and then you properly back up the Workspace account with an automated cloud-to-cloud -cloud backup. Now, we have solutions available. If you're interested in them, click on the link below, have a chat to our team, and they'll be happy to help you out recommending a solution for you. And we have options from multiple different vendors with different price points. But don't forget to also back up your individual workstations. Now, Google Drive lets you back up quite a bit straight into Google Drive, which is nice and useful. But if you're using local applications and you want a more sophisticated point in time restore, or if you just want to make sure that you've got all of your bases covered, like somebody accidentally saving a file to their desktop or to their My Documents drive, instead of saving it into My Drive or to shared drives, which will synchronize with online, well, you may be interested to roll out a more sophisticated desktop-based backup system. The Essential 8 is a comprehensive framework which we've just scratched the surface of. I hope this has been helpful for you to implement some more stringent security practices in your business. Now, in our next video in the series, I'm gonna talk about some of the biggest risks that SMEs face and exactly why these have been implemented. Make sure you look out for that one in the next video. If you like this content, please hit subscribe and hit the bell notification so you can be notified when we go live or drop new content on the channel. If you'd like to connect with us, hit us up on social media or join our free community group. All the links to that are right below this video. If you'd like to learn more about Google Workspace and the technology ecosystem, you can join our free Genius Academy by transferring your billing across to IT Genius. Or you can join a Workspace Basics Bootcamp. Now, if you're a business owner and you're interested in an audit on your technology stack or your workspace account, or you're looking to do a project in the tech world, well, you can take advantage of our free consultation. And if you need help right now, then consider joining Concierge or taking up a quick fix with our team for professional support for your tech stack.